hello everyone, thank you for turning up. My name is Mick, uh, I'm an Australian that has immigrated to Norway. I work for a company called Finn, uh, which is Norway's largest, busiest website and a classifieds website. The talk, uh, this talk is going to be a run through of use cases we have in production on Cassandra. It's not going to be a particularly clever or innovative talk and we're certainly not going to try and sell you anything that we've written on top of Cassandra that we think you should be using too. It's rather going to be a plain sell of Cassandra. If there's a reason for me to want to do this talk, it's uh, in the hope that I can inspire confidence to uh, bring Cassandra to production, to bring it to production faster, or to use Cassandra more than you are already using today. A little bit about the company, Finn. It's a classified website, and it has a very broad monopoly uh, on the classifieds in the country. Here we're talking about real estate, job listings, trading post, vehicles, bits and pieces, uh, travel, cheapest flights, cheapest hotels, cheapest car hire. The only other country in the world which has everything on one website and is a monopoly or dominant player is New Zealand. And being an Australian, I couldn't possibly go work there. <laughs> There's another interesting story behind Finn, and that's it was started up in the late 90s and year 2000. And it was started up by the country's largest newspaper corporation with the intention of cannibalizing their own profits. It's a remarkably refreshing story when you look at newspaper corporations around the world today. And certainly that spirit and drive for innovation in the company is as strong today. I've stolen here a slide from Doug Cutting in a Hadoop presentation, but I think it's equally uh, appropriate for Cassandra or any new big technology. It's certainly an experience, uh, a story which is applicable to us. Any big established company in their right mind doesn't jump on uh, a big uh, paradigm shifting technology without hitting a use case that simply can't be solved any other way. And it can be quite challenging to get that new technology into production. And on top of that, you're working with a challenging use case and bringing that into production. Uh, but what you find once you've uh, tackled that you realize when you look around, there's all these small, simple use cases in your company that fit so much better on top of Cassandra than they do on your, trad your traditional databases. And so now that we're using Cassandra more and more for simple stuff, we have more teams coming to us in the company and asking, hey, we think we've got a use case that's going to work well on Cassandra. And this is a rough checklist that we have. Do you have a high write throughput? Do you have a schemaless uh, design? Or do you have a data model with a lot of joins? Because we don't do joins anymore. Uh, volume of data, uptime, etc. I've made this talk a little bit difficult for myself because I wanted to go through some of those u simple use cases and also go through our initial uh, advanced use case, which is going to presume some knowledge of Hadoop. Uh, either way, please bear with me. Before I go into the simple use cases, I'd like to go through our production cluster. We're not Netflix, we're not eBay. We don't have a particularly large cluster. I still wanted to share this story because I think it's applicable for a lot of people. A lot of companies are our size and a lot of people when they're starting off with Cassandra are going to start off with a smaller cluster um, before picking bigger, building bigger. Six nodes separated across two physical data centers. Four of the nodes run Hadoop. Uh, Cassandra's the community's recommendation is to always put your Hadoop Cassandra nodes in a separate analytic data center. We don't actually do that uh, simply because we haven't got enough nodes yet. 
maybe that may happen down the track. Uh, but we also find that those four nodes with Hadoop, 99% of the time, give us performance acceptable for web response times. But we've added these two extra nodes, each in their own virtual data center with their own replica, just to ensure that 1% when Hadoop is trying to bring Cassandra to its knees, that we're still serving responses to the web applications in a decent enough time. So the first use case is uh, user search history. This is just like with Google, you go into your profile page, you can see all the searches that you've done for the last six months or three months for us. Exactly the same use case. It works really well on Cassandra. It uses the time to live feature, fantastic feature of Cassandra. It is write heavy as opposed to reads and it has wide rows. Each user has their own petition key and the searches just for each user are tacked on. You can see that in the performance. Write performance is fantastic. Read performance, 10 milliseconds, that's okay, but keep in mind that those reads are taking the whole history for one user. They're quite big reads. I'm a bit worried about time, so I'm going to jump over one of those use cases, but you can download, download the slides afterwards and have a look if you want. Third use case is fraud detection. That is... Uh, like any classifiers website, we have a real problem with, with fraudulent ads and general misbehavior. And it's never the bad guy that gets the blame. Who gets the blame? We get the blame. So we spend a lot of time having to manually vet ads as they come into us. We're gonna, and we're trying to speed that process up by, with a long list of rules. As each ad comes in, we sc score them and keep the scores in a map. Um, for each ad. And then the end of, at the end of the day, once the manual vetting result has come in, we can compare them and we're getting a good idea of which rules are safe or which thresholds are safe to automatically detect fraudulent ads. Again, fantastic performance. I haven't put the read. JMX is playing up a little bit on me. Yeah, if anyone can tell me why, I'd, I'd really like to know. Um, I haven't put the reads in because they just happen once a day. The fourth use case is message inbox. Funny enough, this is the same use case that Cass Cassandra was written for at a Facebook. Each user has, for each of the ads they put in, a separate inbox and a separate thread for all of the conversations against each potential buyer. This system uh, has two components to it. One is for the inbox data and one is for the email aliases. And we don't simply provide one email alias for each user. Instead, for each user's ad and um, potential buyer conversation, we have a separate uh, alias, email alias. So we're collecting uh, tens, 50,000 email aliases each day um, around all these ads. This allows us, when an email comes into us, to check is this an email from someone who is part of and established in that conversation? And is it an email on an ad which is still active and the user still wants communication on? And so that's helped us with spam and general security issues, which has been a big problem for us and is indeed the primary reason that we've implemented message inboxes at Finn. The SQL for this example is more complex, and so we've used the query builder from the DataStax driver, which really does make life easy for you. This is one of only two use cases that we have in Finn, which 
uh, require strong consistency. When an email alias uh, an email comes in, that alias must match to an email address. Because of that, this was sitting in Sybase first until we were 110% confident that we could run it in Cassandra. And what we found when we put it into Cassandra, the performance improved 20 to 40 times, <coughs> even with strong consistency. The other part of message inbox is storing the actual messages. That too has fantastic performance. We're really happy. We don't use CQL for that. It's quite complex. We have a lot of secondary indexes there. We have separate column family with counters. Uh, okay. So that wraps up the simple use cases. So two our use case which got us started with Cassandra, time series, event tracking and aggregation or event statistics as we call it. This is all the statistics that we show to the user on the website. We're not talking business intelligence here or analytics. This is what's in our product. Each user gets lots of different statistics. How many people have shown, how many people have seen their ad, how many emails around the ad have been sent, how many people have marked it as favorite. This used to be in Sybase and was updated real time. And there it was taking 50% of the database's right time. In fact, in peak traffic, if there were any signs of problems with the database, operations would, the first thing they would do would turn that right procedure off. That is when users were getting the most traffic on their ads, we stopped counting. So we had to come up with something new. And we looked for a asynchronous, fault tolerant and linearly scaling solution. And so we came up with something like this. It's come a long way in the last two years. This is more what it looks like today. But we have uh, an event collection part of this system. We have where events come in, they come into Cassandra into a, a raw events column family. Then we have Hadoop jobs running every minute or every day, depending on the statistics. And then upgrade, um, updating separate column families in Cassandra. And then we have a separate module which reads those statistics and serves them back to the product. Those events, they can be happening from inside our own platform, server-side <laughs> events. They can also be client-side events. Um, so we've kind of got our own tracking solution here. But slightly different purpose. Before in Sybase we were only counting totals. Now we're counting quarter hours, hours, days, months, years, totals. We can also count on uh, as many different dimensions as we want. So here are some examples that we've got. Uh, that's um, the different Categories of traffic, page views, emails sent, breakdown on user agent, what type of devices you're getting traffic from, a referring domain, and the horizontal bar chart is you repeat visitors, which is a good indication of the seriousness of potential buyers. So looking into the system, the first I want to look into the event collection side of things. Our events are thrift beans, and they're very, very simple. We have a type, which is like an ad. Something happened to an ad. We have a subcategory, uh, which is like page viewed or email sent or marked as favorite. And then just a map of values. That, that will hold the ID of the ad, uh, the user agent, referring domain, et cetera, et cetera. I mentioned describe network. We have since installed Kafka into production. The last two years we have been unhappy with Scribe. It's not fault tolerant where we believed it was. Uh, 
we've lost too many buffers after a period of downtime. And its <coughs> options are just archaic. Some options don't work at all. They're just relics of Facebook code. Other options work, but only in specific combinations with, with other options. And there's no documentation, and the community seems to be dead. Kafka, on the other hand, is uh, very much alive. Um, it's a, rather than just a whole lot of individual processes on different machines, it's actually a cluster. So you can send to it synchro synchronously, which means you don't run the risk <coughs> of losing messages in memory. Keep in mind that the big picture is still an asynchronous system. And most important, Kafka is stream processing. A lot of these events which are coming in are valuable pieces of information. And there are consumers within our own platform that want to listen to those events in real time. They don't want to have to piggyback themselves on the back of a Hadoop job. So the schema for the events when they come into Cassandra looks something like this. We keep one partition key, or one, yeah, one partition key for each minute. So the events are just going into minute rows. We have the time, the exact timestamp, the type, the subcategory, and the map. The map we keep as a JSON string. This part of the system wouldn't perform if we were using the map data type. And then we take the row key and we duplicate it again into a column so that we can put a secondary index on that. Before secondary indexes in Cassandra, we had to use an order preserving petitioner. If there's one thing that I can say, and that is please, for the love of God, don't use an order preserving petitioner. It's a complete nightmare. Of course, the real world isn't that simple. First of all, our minute rows, we manually petition by adding an extra random digit. Uh, we don't want hot rows in the system. Also, an event has two timestamps. It has the real timestamp when it happened, and it has the collected timestamp when it came into Cassandra. The minute by minute Hadoop jobs, they're interested in all the events with a collected timestamp within the last minute. Whereas if I want to do a more um, analytic type job of how much referring traffic did I get from Facebook yesterday, all the events with the real timestamp of yesterday. But for the rest of the talk, I want to focus just on the simple schema. OK, so the next section is the Hadoop and MapReduce side of things. Before I start talking about that, I want to just show what the aggregated data is going to end up looking like. Here, this relates to the statistics I showed you in the screenshot in the beginning. For each ad, we have all the statistics as counters for all the roll-ups in one row. A lot of the blogs that you've seen uh, probably on time series on Cassandra, you'll see that they put roll-ups in separate column families. We haven't done that. We, we found it's okay all in one. We do have a separate cleanup job that runs once a day and deletes uh, the smaller roll-ups um, once they get a certain age, since counters don't have time to live. Um, and you can see, along with the roll-up and timestamp, there was all those subcategories again. This system was originally written with super columns. If you're still using super columns, stop. Take one guess at where we switch to a composite columns on this graph. OK, so to a Hadoop. When a Hadoop job starts, it does two queries to the events table. The first is to get the list of splits. Each split becomes a task, and the job tracker sends each task to a task tracker. Here we keep life simple for ourselves, and each minute row is one split. Um, and so there we're using the secondary index. Once a task gets to a task tracker, the record reader is responsible for loading up all the data out of that split. Here, we're just doing slices within that row, 100 at a time. 
is a really important part um, to talk about here, and that is data locality. The performance and throughput of a, your Hadoop jobs depend on data locality. And unfortunately, because Cassandra only supports Hadoop 0.20, you can't really enforce data locality. You can give it the hints when you create those splits, you give it the locations of where that data is found, but it's only a hint. You find that when the job tracker is handing out the tasks, if all the task trackers where that data would be locally found are currently busy, but there are other task trackers free, job tracker won't wait. It ships them straight off. It's only in Hadoop 0.22 with this property and the fair scheduler that you can say job tracker wait uh, for one of those task trackers to free up to ensure that you get data locality. I put a link here to a GitHub project which takes Cassandra's integration classes to Hadoop and it's a very simple patch uh, that gets it to run with Hadoop 0.22 and onwards. We have found using that the data locality goes up above 99%. The map reduce algorithm is very simple. It's just a glorified word count. For each of those events, pick up the ID that you're um, interested in, count it as one, combine it all together. We have this extra dimension for those subcategories. And then uh, in the reduce job, for each roll up, um, put it in. So at the end of the job, you get all of those combined numbers for each of the, the ad ID, each of the ad IDs and each of the roll-ups, and it just gets dumped onto the existing counters in Cassandra. In production, we have about five and a half thousand minute jobs each day, about six full day jobs during the night. That's around 300 million records into the system and 50 million records out of the system each day. One of those day jobs is it taking about 80 million or 100 million records in and writing out half a million to three million records out? And we have seen those uh, jobs run in as little as three to four minutes. So that's performance that we're really happy with. And we're maintaining web latency on the system at the same time. The graph here is really important. Um, because those peaks are not our peak traffic. Our Cassandra graphs are different to all the other performance graphs uh, we have. All of our performance graphs go up a little bit as we hit peak traffic. Cassandra remains dead flat through our peak traffic. Those peaks are the reads in the middle of the night when we run the full day jobs. And those six full day jobs, we throw it all on at once. We hit Hadoop hard and heavy. We want to see how the things, how everything works uh, when Hadoop is doing its best to bring it to its knees. And so if you go back and look at all the other performance graphs, you'll see the same peaks. They're being caused from this. Those peaks on the other graphs, the performance is doubling or, or tripling. So the latency is doubling or tripling. Um, but it's not a problem because performance is um, so good already. So we, we've got some assurance in this system. We use PIG. Uh, we use PIG for debugging, very valuable, and for ad hoc jobs. You don't want to have to write code and deploy it to run your ad hoc, ad hoc job. I found PIG to be a bit... Uh, Difficult to learn. Uh, one thing is to learn it, but it's got some peculiarities there too. Um, but once you've got a little bit under your belt, it, it helps a lot. Uh, the last, this is my last slide on user centric statistics. The last slide on this use case. Uh, for user-centric statistics, we have taken a simple approach that is just using the framework that we've already got, but it aggregating on user IDs instead of ad IDs. 
um, and instead of the existing subcategories, we have a long list of tags. That can be all the area codes that we know about, all the brands of cars, all the keywords in job listings, etc. And so that for each user, we then have quite a rich profile of what they're interested in. Uh, and we use that to then build a poor man's uh, recommendation system to a solar search. Uh, this is the approach that we wanted to uh, start with. We wanted something that we could understand, uh, that we could easily, easily measure the results of before we would go forward to some of the more complicated solutions out there. For example, the taste recommendation system from Mahal, which is today further developed in Mirix. If you want to go down that route, uh, you are again going to need to upgrade to Hadoop 0.22. You will need to hack some classes in Mahal and you're going to start to, well, at least in our case, you're going to have to de-normalize a lot more data into Cassandra. All of your content has to be there, and etc. Okay, so that wraps up the advanced use case. Uh, first slide. I've got two slides left. The first slide is really a compliment to the Cassandra community. Cassandra has come a long way in the last two years. They keep on coming out with stuff that makes our system run faster and faster, or makes our design or code redundant. We're like, oh, we don't need to do that anymore. <coughs> Wonderful. I take it away and uh, write something new. So composite columns, you saw the performance increase that gave over super columns. Secondary indexes, a far better approach than auto-preserving petitioner. Compression, originally our events column family was storing those thrift beans in their serialized state. They were serialized over thrift and byte array and we were just putting them straight in to events column family. Uh, th that was disk space, mainly. Problem with that is that <coughs> no one can actually read, the, read it. Uh, and transparency is gold for adoption of new technologies. Counters, really important, but if there's anyone from Datastacks here, we really want the second implement implementation of counters that give you petition tolerance. CQL3, fantastic. Uh, we're doing everything in CQL3 now. And being able to use CQL and MapReduce has been a huge step forward too. Okay, so the lessons that we have learned along the way. Avoid order preserving petitioner. Avoid custom serialized data. Avoid skinny rows on non-commodity machines. Uh, I don't know if this is still the case for Cassandra 2, but um, in Cassandra 1 and 1.1, I believe, if you were getting billions, um, billions and billions of rows on each node, your bloom filters were getting large, um, all, of this, uh, all, all of this stuff which was previously in the heap was just getting larger and larger and larger and it was causing problems. CQL3 rocks. Don't run job tracker and name node on a Cassandra node. Uh, in the beginning, we had faulty RAID controllers from HP. And they were locking up our machines multiple times each day. Can you imagine if that was happening to your traditional MySQL or Sybase? It was locking up on you twice a day. It would be a business disaster. Because Cassandra wasn't a problem, except for the job tracker and the name node. Whenever it happened to that node, Hadoop went down. So since we have moved job tracker and name node to a very small, separate virtual server, 
they both use very little memory, uh, so it's very easy to move them out. Make it easy to bump your consistency level for reads and writes up um, in operations. You find that when you do Cassandra operations like moving a node or adding a node, some applications uh, you, you'll want to increase consistency level from one decorum. Um, you can see some funny behavior there. And you don't want to have to rewrite code and deploy it. This is an operational thing. Keep it operational. Uh, the other thing that we've uh, learnt is pay attention to disk latency and utilization. You find that if it goes above 20%, or for us, if it goes above 20%, that's usually, you, you should look into it. Uh, you, you could be asking for trouble. Some of the tuning that we have done is use the no-op scheduler for the kernel. I know that Patrick mentioned uh, using the, CF, the CFQ uh, scheduler, which is a default on Linux, I believe. That's what we were using, and uh, for us, when we checked out NOOP, it gave much better throughput. I'm not saying that NOOP is correct for you, but I, that's something to experiment with to find, what, <coughs> find out what works right for you. We use no A time, of course. And we have moved the journal for the main data disk onto SSD. And we also minimize I.O. for uh, other processes. Cassandra and Hadoop both want sequential writing. OK. That's me. Um, two minutes over time. That's good. Thank you for your time. Uh, I hope you've gotten something from it. Questions? Yes. Yes. So the question was, how does Hadoop read um, the, the time span? Yeah. Yes. The, it's because we have that extra column with a secondary index so that we can, uh, we're not doing queries based on row keys. We're doing queries based on that secondary index. <coughs> yeah? It's a good question, um, and I can't quite, can't quite remember it. We did go I mean, two years ago. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Have you found that the fact that Cassandra needs to do similar to has helped you back in other areas? Yes. Yes, we would have liked to have moved forward with Hadoop. Uh, more. I, I can't give you an exact, sorry, the question was why we're using Cassandra instead of HDFS. I can't give you the exact reason, I just can't, <coughs> can't bring it to mind when we went through it, but what I can say is that uh, we've been a lot more happy with Cassandra than with Hadoop. Uh, Cassandra has been a fantastic product to work with, and certainly I think that Cassandra is your big data platform because uh, it can do a lot of things in real time for you. Um, well, Hadoop is a useful tool to have on top of it because it does the more batch processing side of stuff. Uh, for our HDFS, we keep that on the SSD disk and it's a volatile file system. So if you stop Hadoop, you're always free to wipe it. Um, so it's only really to, for the Hadoop internals. Um,
Cassandra on the fly so that you have it uh, basically online. Have you considered that? Uh, yeah, so the question was um, around using Storm. Okay. Um, we've looked into it. I think that two years ago it wasn't what we wanted, um, wasn't good enough. Uh, uh, hopefully I've shown that a lot of what we've got is quite simple. Yes. It's not that difficult. And f for us, uh, okay, there's been a lot of extra tools that we would have liked. But like we really want to put Hive, for example, on top of... Uh, Cassandra and Hadoop, that would really help out our BI, BI team. Um, but uh, because Cassandra keeps on coming out with new features, and that's the kind of central use case, we're we, we kind of working with that instead. Um, but yeah, we have looked at Storm and other things. Uh, our first priority has been to move on to Kafka instead of Scribe. That, that, adds, that gets us closer to what you're talking about. Yes? Yes, right. Um, can I get back to that slide quickly? Start a locality. Do I have a pointer? I do. This here. <coughs> In your Hadoop logs folder, you will find lines like this. Choosing data local task or choosing rack local, local task. Um, it tells you what, that, what the job tracker is doing, where it's handing out nodes and what the locality of that is. So that's from Hadoop. Yes? Yes. How, does, how do they work? Is it just, they're just two nodes you haven't installed yet, the, the data node and the... Like we that. use network uh, topology strategy. Um, and so the advanced use case, it doesn't keep a replica in the two do virtual data centers that so don't have Hadoop. Yeah. Yeah, so all of our applications, which are non, all the simple use cases I went through, they have a replica right. in those low latency dedicated virtual sets. So the three ones, make sure you don't put any of the, the data on that you don't need. Yeah, them. yeah. So it's, it's never going to reach out to those servers. Yes. You're not to one window. So I guess you said that you started with Cassandra two years ago. So I guess it was one window. Zero point. Or even 0 0.7, 0 so 0.8. Like yeah, yeah. Can talk about it, let's say. Uh, yeah, be careful upgrading to the major versions and going crazy with settings. Um, we got bitten quite hard by, uh, we upgraded quickly to Cassandra 1 because it offered compression and we could see what that, that was a huge win for us. And we jumped in and tweaked a whole lot of settings which we thought would be good for us, and uh, yeah. And from 1.1 to 1.2, because there's a big CQRC improvement. Yeah, but that's all been sweet for us. We haven't okay. had it. we haven't had any other problems. Um, before we upgrade to Cassandra 2, we need to do the switch to V nodes, um, and once we've done that, we'll then go to 201 or 202. No more questions? Okay. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you.